go, talking a lot more about those two parameters as we go through the presentation. So why do we do risk assessments? Why do you need to know about risk assessment? What, you know, what, what's the purpose of them? Basically, to inform risk managers. It's often more useful to have the assessment separated from the managers. It's also to alert and to inform those who need to know about events in a consistent and comparative way. It's useful for pre preparedness and emergency planning. Also to provide guidance and advice to a wide range of stakeholders, inform the media, we're all driven by the media now, I'm afraid, whichever context we work. Also to advise policy and policy makers, and certainly from what we do in the UK, a lot of our work is advising government on what they should and shouldn't do. And also, in many cases, certainly in our case, it was to provide the government with reassurances that robust <laughs> systems were actually in place. We have a risk assessment process. Since most emerging infections are zoonotic in origin, we have to take a One Health approach to these, and this is what Tiable will be going through, because assessing new and emerging infections, especially at the animal-human interface, you need the One Health approach, uh, and especially for new animal conditions such as corona. When we talk of risk, again, it's one of those terms people bandy about. Just remember what threat are we talking about. This is a slide I was using for our UK perspective. So what threats are we looking for? We did horizon scanning looking for risks which we then assess, or threats that we then assessed um, to be able to report them as, 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 as a, uh, from the risk assessment. So we basically didn't do influenza. There's lots of people doing that, measles. We were looking at high consequence infections, particularly new infections at the animal-human interface, and also so unknown infections, they cause us no end of problems. When we've got a diagnosis, it's all, it makes it easier in many examples, but it's that unknown stage where animals are sick, humans are sick, and that's where the risk assessment process is essential. We started off by looking at risks to the UK population, and then after various demands for various organisations, we expanded it to UK interests anywhere, which turned out to be almost all the world. And where are we talking about risk? Are we talking in the community, in, in which countries, at borders? Uh, and we'll be looking at that in more detail. And of course, the consequences of getting it wrong are enormous. We've seen Italy now where they've quarantined 16 million people, and I think that's now gone up whole country now uh, and certainly we have bitter experience in the UK where we got um, bovine spongy form encephalopathy in cows which 10 years later was found to uh, give variant say JD in humans we got the risk assessment there badly wrong and everyone working in that area got named and shamed so there were various sorts of risk assessment, lots of sorts of risk assessment. You do risk assessments every day just crossing the road, or do you have that ice to bun or not? That's a risk assessment you do. Do I? What's the risk of this? But once we're talking here about rapid risk assessment, and this is in response to potential public or animal health concerns, and this is taken to quickly evaluate the risk to human health. This is often difficult because when uh, as there is a new condition, um, it's complex and challenging. Things, information's coming in all the time. You've got limited data and limited evidence on which to base that risk assessment, and it's constantly being revised. Often this is in public glare. You've got the media, whatever you report gets put on the front of the newspapers. So it can be quite challenging doing rapid risk assessments. Uh, it's no good telling your minister, well, we've just commissioned this. We've got some modelling in place. Come back in three months, we'll tell you then. No, he wants it within 24 hours. So there is pressure here, but we still have to do the best we can and give a clear estimate of the scale of that health threat. The outcome of your rapid risk assessment will determine the degree of escalation, whether a response is indicated or not, the urgency and magnitude of the response. If the probability is low and the impact is low, you probably won't rush to respond to that one. The design of your critical control measures, and also it informs the wider implication and further management of the incident. And it allows you to prioritise resources, support risk management, and be able to communicate in an efficient way. 
risk is probability times impact, and the risk to a population from a communicable disease is the probability of that occurring in the population, uh, sorry, of, of it ha or happening in, the po in a specified population, and the impact should that actually occur. I put context there. This is all the stuff that surrounds it, because we don't just deal with those parameters alone. We've got all the politics and the media and the public uh, attention and all the stuff we're dealing with COVID at the moment. It's, I, we always found it much better to report probability and impact separately because a low probability, high impact event is very different from the other way around. But often policymakers want to know a risk uh, overall, and so we would, um, we would mention that. You've probably heard of qualitative versus quantitative risk assessments. Uh, quanti quantitative are where you need uh, components or risk parameters or measurements, and then you get a numerical score at the end. Uh, um, when you've got an emerging event like we have for COVID, and we'll just, uh, I'll mention this later, it, again, is um, we don't know many of these things. We don't really know what the incubation period is definitely. We don't know what the mortality rate is definitely. And so it's very easy to put all the numbers in based on very, very, very poor evidence and get a number out. You know, the risk is P0001. When in fact, there's very dodgy data gone in there, but we do rely on the outputs from these, these uh, quantitative risk assessments. Qualitative risk assessments is what we do. It allows you to do a rapid assessment with limited information, but then also outline the uncertainties and the doubts you have over how good the data is. Lots of methods have been published. We've got the animal human risk assessment one as I developed, and that's on the gov.uk website. Uh, we've got the WHO, and we've got the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. There are other risk assessments available. This is just a selection. I, I, was, I was involved in certainly two out of the three. But we've also got the tripartite, the ORE, WHO, FAO risk assessment, which uh, the, the joint risk assessment, which TABLA will present next. Basically, we, we, why we do a risk assessment is to be rapidly communicate risk in a hierarchy of robust and consistent terms. We tend to use the five OIE categories, uh, which are sh shown here, but I think the JRA uses a slightly modified form. So we stuck with OIE and we have five categories. They're all agreed by the group doing the risk assessment and we use expert input as possible. When you're talking to policymakers, they want to know what does low mean? Is low the same as being run over by a train or struck by lightning? And I don't think it's very useful. I mean, we've tried to come, we've worked with the vets coming up with risk descriptors of what low, very low, moderate means. And we never really came up with uh, 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 a useful terms. So what we did instead is we did the expected actions. So if you've got a low probability or impact, then implementations or mitigation strategies should be considered. Get them ready. Uh, um, whereas if it goes to moderate, you should review them immediately, get them off the shelf, make sure they're fit for purpose. So by doing outcomes with the various categories, uh, I think that's more useful than being struck by lightning or run over by a train. But what is crucial here, I think what was important in these, in, in these developments was actually putting down or grading the evidence that goes into doing this risk assessment. What evidence do you have? And, and for COVID, it's fairly limited. Uh, but then you highlight the uncertainties, and these are very clearly documented in the risk assessment. We're putting in this, but we're really not sure how good it is. Expert knowledge, we rely a lot on that for new, inf new infections. But again, it's important to distinguish between knowledge based on good research and experience and opinion-based knowledge. We have a lot of experts, you've seen them all with COVID, appearing on the television, giving their opinion. They've got no evidence, they often haven't got much experience, but they've got very strong opinions. There's lots of, uh, there are formal systems for grading evidence, but for a rapid risk assessment, we really don't have those formal systems. It, it, they don't work because time and evidence are limited. 
we have to rely on observational data or case studies, and we rely on expert knowledge where basically that gets graded really poorly. So they're not very useful. But we come up with our own grading, and this has also gone through into the JRA, good in how good our risk assessment is. And this is always included in the risk assessment. The probability is low, the impact is high, and really the confidence is satisfactory. It's not particularly good data there. This is the weatherman. I don't know if now, if it, 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 certainly on the BBC, they say tomorrow there's a 22% chance of rain. What they don't say, and there's a 1% chance I'm right. And this is what the confidence is. It's how right you're likely to be. So risk assessment should be transparent, systematic and objective, rapid and reproducible. There's new information coming all the time. You're constantly having to review them. They also identify the need to a formal, for a formal expert group. Sometimes when you're doing risk assessments, you start off and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And think, hey, hey, get a bit, bit, bit stressed here. Let's get some heavyweights in here because we also need them to contribute and get them to sign up. But it is useful for promoting risk-based, risk-informed decision-making. You've got the risk assessment, you've got your evidence, and it can be communicated. Uh, certainly in our government, uh, we had various categories. So we said if the, risk, if the likelihood's low, impact's low, they said, don't even bother telling us. Just inform us when it gets to moderate. Uh, and so we can communicate very well. Uh, it's best done in a multidisciplinary cross-sectional team and everyone signs up to the assessments and statements. So I'm just going to do one slide on risk communication. I know you've had a session on risk communication as well, but I think a risk assessment communication is slightly different. So if you allow me one slide, what once it's finished in whatever form you do it, it's important to communicate. There's no point doing them if you don't communicate these. Uh, use clear, simple language. We love our acronyms. We love our technical terms. But the people who are reading this may not. Use consistent risk descriptors. I hate this. Well, it's fairly, it's fairly severe, or it's fair. You know, stick to the the risk descriptors. It doesn't matter which ones you use, but stick to the ones uh, consistently throughout your risk assessments. Don't assume others at, uh, understand the terms or words you assume are obvious. I'm sure we've all had these embarrassing encounters where you're discussing something you assume the other person knows what you're talking about and they don't. It happens quite often to me, but anyway. Uh, but don't assume people understand the terms you're using. State any uncertainties or gaps in knowledge. Don't make your documents too long. If you've got a policy maker and you give, him a, pa give a document more than four pages, they're not going to read it. You may need to justify not about why you do things, but also why you don't do things. We didn't close schools at this point in time because the evidence was blah, 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 it's documented. And be prepared for repercussions. So just to summarise where we're up to now, risk assessments often have to be undertaken very rapidly based on poor evidence. This is often under intense professional, political and media attention and certainly with Zika we, we had that very much in the UK even though we weren't particularly at risk. Good scientific evidence should underpin the risk assessment process and guidance irrespective of what time you have. Gaps in knowledge need to be clearly outlined in the risk assessment. Include confidence, it gives a really good overview of the quality of the evidence and I think as practitioners we all rely on evidence to justify and explain what we do and ensure complete documentation of the process with a clear version control. I was involved in an outbreak where everything was done properly but it wasn't clearly documented and then the group were completely slaughtered because they didn't document why they didn't do an action on a certain date. And the evidence at that date was, was, was impeccable. It, it was, reasons were there, but it wasn't documented. But it does make sure decisions become easier to explain, justify. It also acts as a log for why you did this in the point of time. And in a rapidly evolving situation, as in COVID, we have to constantly explain why we didn't do this at this point in time. We had these numbers, we had this evidence, we didn't do actions. Uh, and it's, it's for risk managers and policy makers. 
It's not all joy. I'm just going to give you a, war, a few warnings about risk assessments. You can do the best risk assessment in the world. It can be fantastic. It can be good. You can have good evidence. You can be really pleased with it. But it doesn't always re result in appropriate policy interventions, actions, guidance, and media reports. I'd like to tell you it does. It helps, but it doesn't. Politics override everything, and the media will look to twist what you're saying every possible way. Actions and guidance must be proportionate to the risk. We know what the risks are, we, but often we introduce measures we feel uncomfortable doing, but the public and the politicians expect this. This is more difficult for low probability, high impact events or high probability, low impact events, which is probably what will, on a personal basis, what will happen with COVID. We also manage expectations. We are expected to introduce this. We are expected to do that rather than what's ac the actual risk. And a lot of what we do is maybe not justified by the, the risk. The opportunity cost, why are we doing all of these other things towards screening and this and that and the other? People are still becoming sick, they're still going to need treatment, and anything we do above uh, what is necessary are opportunity costs. What Whatever country you're in, whatever you do for the new thing, don't forget the old things and conditions uh, and, and resources are still needed. And it's quite difficult. Certainly we saw this in Zika. Um, when we were giving um, sexual, uh, we're giving advice about reducing sexual transmission, you, we only had three papers on which we all based the evidence. CDC US, WHO, European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, they all gave different times, whether they, it was a male, female, um, symptomatic, asymptomatic. Everyone gave different advice, and it was very confusing. We were giving what we thought was the interpretation of, of, of what these papers said, but it's quite hard to stick to that line when the big players are saying something else. And certainly for Zika, in the end, WHO said six months, uh, use a barrier method Method when having sexual intercourse six months having been to a, an area where transmission was occurring. By that stage, transmission was occurring all over the world. And this is irrespective of whether they were trying to become pregnant or were pregnant. So the message to pregnant women or women want to become pregnant was lost because everyone was supposed to be using barrier methods for six months irrespective of their condition. So messages do get lost. So think very carefully get risk-based messages out. So beware the risk of the risk assessments. Uh, it can be can shorten your career in many cases, but making sure they're robust, they're pin, underpinned by evidence and everything's clearly documented can help.